but the thing of it is, we got to realize. I'm just, you know, just, just being, you know, you, there's a, in the Marine Corps, there's a thing called uh, uh, objective reality. You have to look and see it as it is, not as you would like it to be, not as it should be, but as it is. And sometimes you have to look and say, what am I doing? We went up that, we went over here last time, and it didn't work out. Maybe we should try, rather than going that same way again, maybe we should try it going over there. Okay, uh, petitions and lawsuits. Lawsuits, so once again, we are going to ask the federal government to side with us against a federal agency. Hmm. Not that you can't win those, but seriously. And what happens, what happens when uh, uh, Justice uh, Scalia retires or dies? You know, God forbid, what would happen if, if uh, Chief Justice, Tho or Ch Justice Thomas, who's probably the most strict constructionist of them all, God bless him, what if he got run over by a bus or something? You know, we can't put all of our hopes in a tiny little oligarchy that was never designed to protect us. I mean, it was designed to protect us, but it was not d designed to be absolute. All right, so are these things forcing the federal government to follow the Constitution? Sadly, not that we haven't had victories here and there, but overall, no. All right. So uh, Robert H. Jackson, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, said, it is not the function of our government to keep the citizen from falling into error. It is the function of the citizen to keep the government from falling into error. We've been told this for, since the country was founded. We, we have, you know, we've kind of been uh, victims of our own success. We kind of got fat, dumb, and happy, right? Things were going pretty good. Things were going well. We're working, you know. We kind of, we forgot that it is our final responsibility to keep control. Uh, George Washington said, to paraphrase, government is like fire. It is a fearful master, excuse me, it is a fearful servant, and it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And we have forgotten that, right? You, you got it, you got to watch the fire. Okay. All right, the Constitutional County Project is advocating the participation of citizens in all aspects of politics at the county level to support local and legitimately elected government. We uphold constitutional law uh, and the preservation of life, liberty, and property. We have to start doing it. There's uh, w the reasons why we talk about the county level. Uh, why do we focus on the county level? Economy of scale, okay? How many of you, um, how many of you, have, okay, uh, how many of you have John McCain's phone number? How many of you could call him and get him on the phone right now? He wouldn't answer. There you go. Okay. How many of you think he'd return your message? Okay. Now, on the other hand, how many of you have, pardon? Okay, very possible. Here's the thing. How many of you, on the other hand, uh, who's your, uh, what LD am I in? LD26, okay. Well, in whatever LDs you're in, how many of you have the, uh, know your state representatives or state senators? How many of you have their numbers? How many of you could call them and talk to them? Okay, what about, uh, what about city councils? Here's the thing, guys. Where I live up in Navajo County, there's only 120,000 people in the whole county, okay? I actually, uh, God rest his soul, remember uh, uh, Chester Crandall? I actually called Chester Crandall at home on a Sunday. I actually did that because uh, 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 I needed to hook him up with, with, uh, with Shane. But I called him, he, is a, he was a deeply devout religious man. I hesitated to do it, but I called him at home on a Sunday. You know how I got his number? I got it out of the phone book. And you know what? His wife answered, and I apologized to her for disturbing them on a Sunday, but I said it was important, and she put him on the phone. So the idea being is that at the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, it, other levels of government, 
they're much more accessible to the people, especially in uh, especially in the lower population, you know, lower populated, less densely populated areas, obviously. But even down here, you've got a heck of a lot better chance of getting a hold of your state or city councilman or, or you know somebody in the county than you certainly do of anybody the national the national representative. That's outstanding. He's the exception. The uh, uh, so. Uh, economy of scale, elected, of, oh, and by economy of scale, what we mean too, in here I know you guys, how many of you, you know, you've made the phone calls, you've marched, you've, you've, you've sent emails, you've done calls, all that stuff, right? And the thing being though is that the results, how many of you have ever had a, a congressman or a senator, U.S. senator call you back about whatever, you're, whatever you emailed them or called them about? We have one, a couple. Okay. How, now, how many of you have had a state person do that? I think most people call it, call at the federal level. <laughs> um, the uh, the idea being, though, the idea is that if we focus our efforts at where we are more accessible, where we have more access, we'll have more we'll have more results. And here's the thing: fewer people in a less densely populated area will have a bigger impact. If you get 10 people who, work, who are workhorses, which you guys, you, you guys know, know who they are, and they're down here trying to get something done at the state level, God bless them, they'll, they'll have their effect, and they can do great things. However, those same 10 people at a county level of 120,000 or 200,000 versus 6 million, they're going to have a much bigger impact. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, results can be attained faster. Elected officials are more directly, are more directly accountable, and the law enforcement is directly accountable to the people via the election process. This is the only level of government where the actual enforcement arm. I'm not talking about the attorneys general because they're law enforcement too. But what am I talking about at the county level? County sheriff, right? If we don't like the what the county sheriff is doing, we can we can we the people can throw him out. Okay. Now, there are 3,000 plus counties and county equivalents within the United States. Do you think that we have a better chance of getting maybe one county here, there, there to actually follow the Constitution as written as opposed to getting the whole thing all at once? Does that make sense? So the idea is, how do, you, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Here's the thing. We get all worked up. Is we're coming up on an election year, right? And we get all worked up by this guy and that guy, and I can't believe he said that, and look at his hair and all that stuff, right? And we get a false choice because, let's face it, and I'm an independent, but honestly, overall, was the Bush presidency and the Obama presidency that much different? Not really. Not really. All right. So, all right, here's the idea. C create areas where the Constitution is truly the supreme law of the land all across the country. Provide a safe haven where hardworking innovators can apply their craft under the umbrella of protection that our founders intended. Review and repeal all county laws which are not constitutional and elect a sheriff whose first priority is honoring his oath to enforce the Constitution. Okay. We're going to go into, we're going to show how this has actually been done. All right, a constitutional county is, is a legitimately elected county government that is subject to constitutional, federal, and state laws, but will interpose against unconstitutional federal or state laws or actions. Uh, we're going to go into what interposition is here in just a moment. Outside agencies that attempt to exercise powers that are not enumerated in the U.S. Constitution are not given any material support by the county. Okay? And all organs of county government, including the sheriff, attorney, and board of supervisors, use the legal powers of their elected offices in concert to enforce constitutional law, but protect the residents against unconstitutional law. Can you imagine? Well, we're going to go into what's actually happened. Okay. Right here, we have from CNN, uh, this was in 2013, Oregon Sheriff, unconstitutional gun control laws won't be enforced. So is that law, how many laws on the books are there that are old that we do not uh, have to worry about? 
How many laws out there are not enforced? If they're not enforced, are they, are they relevant? Are our immigration laws relevant at this point in time? Are they? Are they enforced? Are they enforced? If it's not enforced, do you, do, is somebody who's affected by the laws, do they have to worry about it? No. You know that there are, there are uh, you know, we can go through, there's millions of laws that are not enforced right now, okay? So the idea being though, so the point being, if a law is not enforced, it has no effect on my daily life, right? The only reason that we have to worry about things is because at some point somebody will come up and they will enforce them, right? Somebody will come up and they will use coercive force to either take your life, your liberty, or your property to get you to, to comply with, with, their, with their orders, correct? But if nobody's doing that, then the laws are irrelevant. So right here in this Oregon County, I, I suspect that the, uh, the people there don't have to worry about certain laws. Uh, right here, 340 sheriffs refuse to enforce unconstitutional gun control laws. Okay? Now, uh, that's, that's quite a few, guys. That's 340 counters, counties across the United States. Pardon? Well, you know what? We've got to start somewhere, brother. You know? And we've got 300 that are. It's all on how you want to look at it. Um, the, uh, uh, and why am I talking about the sheriffs so much? Well... Here's some uh, examples of interposition. What interposition is, is where you come in, where they, the sheriff says, hey, what you're doing is unconstitutional, therefore unlawful, and we're not going to allow you to do it. You've got to go through me. Okay? Now, uh, there's the uh, uh, idea of opening state lands uh, when federal uh, state, what we mean by state lands is geographically within the state. When federal management agencies, such as the BLM, attempt to cut off access for residents. We're going to show you examples where that's been done. Uh, refusing to confiscate firearms under unconstitutional federal gun control. Refusing to allow agents of the FDA to arrest residents for crimes such as selling raw milk or organic produce. Okay. Um, there, have been, there have been situations where citizens have been deprived of their liberty for the crime of selling raw milk to other consenting people who understood that that was raw milk. Some people... How many of you guys have drank, drank raw milk? Come on, if, you, if you're older and you've ever been anywhere near a farm, I promise you've drank raw milk. We're all still here, amazingly enough. So anyway, uh, but, but to this day, there have been situations where they sent SWAT teams because God knows that, you know, if somebody who does or raw milk has got to be crazy and going to hurt people, and they actually threaten people's lives, which I promise you, uh, when you point a gun at somebody, you are threatening their life to make them stop. It's mind-boggling, but it's happening. And the thing is, is that in these situations, the county sheriff participated in this. It was a federal action, but how does that work? The federal, act, the feds, there's not enough feds to do these things. They have to have help from county, state, and local law enforcement to uh, provide traffic control, to, to you know, add bodies to doing it, and so on. Okay? There's very, there's very rarely is there a simple, single federal action. Okay. All right, uh, oath upheld. Nashville cops refuse Secret Service request for illegal search of Obama critic. There was a guy in Nashville who made some statements on Facebook. Oh, my God. And he said that he was unhappy with the president. They were not violent. They were not threats. They were critical. And the Secret Service asked the local police to go to his home and do some things and search. They said, That's, you don't have the authority to do that. There has been no crime committed. No. So God bless those boys. But this is the model. This is happening all over the United States. Uh, sheriff stands up to IRS, cancels land sale. This was a situation uh, in New Mexico where the IRS came to seize a gentleman's property because of uh, uh, quote-unquote unpaid taxes, but he had not exhausted his appeals process, and the IRS said, we don't care, we're coming to take your stuff anyway. And the sheriff said, no, he has a right to an appeal under the Constitution. He's going to get his appeal. You can't do that. And you know what? They didn't. One detail that's extremely important in this specific case, I know a lot of you probably can't read it, so I'm going to read it for you. The sheriff, quote, physically stood at the gate of a troubled citizen's property while U.S. Marshals threatened his arrest. He physically interposed, put himself between 
the person he's supposed to protect, and the agents, and said no. That's what it takes. It takes courage, and it takes putting the right person that has the constitutional principle in place. And the sheriff, imagine all, the collective effort in here that we've all done. Like I said, I was a delegate at the 2012 RNC convention. Imagine if we took all the enthusiasm and the passion that we have and the desire to live free and the desire to protect and uphold the Constitution, and we applied that locally. Do you think we would have a constitutional sheriff all throughout Arizona? You know it. Absolutely. And the thing of it is, too, folks, is that the difference between me standing there and saying, IRS, you can't do that, and the sheriff doing it. The sheriff is a duly elected uh, law enforcement officer, and he has the constitutional authority to enforce the Constitution. I'm just a citizen. Granted, principle, I'm just as right as the sheriff is, but let's face it. Do you think that the IRS or the federal marshals or the Department of Education SWAT team, whoever it is, is going to have a different reaction to, you know, Joe Citizen versus a, a uh, you know, recognized county, state, or local law enforcement officer? You better believe they are. This is proof. Here's more. Otero County commissioners instruct sheriff to unlock U.S. Forest Service gates. Okay. Dig this. How much... Who here? How much is beef? All time high, right? Why do you think that is? Were we not? Look, I, I, we're in Arizona. We were a cattle straight. Remember the five C's when, way back when of our economy? One of them was cattle because people like to eat beef, right? We were, this, the Western United States did more than the rest of the world combined as far as producing beef. Yet today, Beef is at an all-time high. Why is that? Federal regulations and other actions. In Otero County, in New Mexico, what happened was this. Uh, they have been raising cattle in Otero County for, since the 1800s, okay, for 100 plus years. Uh, there are only two permanent sources of water in, in Otero County. Both are on Forest Service land. So, for the last 100 plus years, actually, when did the Forest Service come into effect? The early 1900s, right? So for the last 80, 90 years since the forest was in effect, the local people um, had access. They, they grazed their cattle on Forest Service land. Here's what happened. Using the Endangered Species Act as a justification. Okay, quick, uh, where in the Constitution does it say that we get to the federal government can regulate uh, endangered species? It doesn't. It doesn't. Therefore, it's, and therefore, unlawful. Okay, so here's what happened here. Using the Endangered Species Act as justification, the Forest Service locked the gates, denied access to the only two permanent sources of water in the whole county for multiple ranches and hundreds of head of cattle. You guys are, some of you here from Arizona, some of you have agriculture backgrounds. What happens when the cows don't get a drink on a regular basis? They die, right? So what they were doing was, they didn't ban cattle ranching, but in effect, what was the result of what they did? They banned cattle ranching, okay? But they didn't have enough courage to do it outright. They had to kind of do it that way. So here's what happened. The Oro County County Commissioners got together and had a meeting and they voted. And they said, they instructed their sheriff, hey, what the federal government did was unlawful. You enforce the law. Go cut the locks. That, and here's the thing, how many of you heard of any big huge standoff and all the Otero County Commissioners and the county government being arrested and hauled off to Leavenworth? Didn't happen. These are just some examples of many that have happened over the years across the country. Whenever the, Fed, the county government stands up, they win. The only time they don't win is when they back down. Okay. All right. Now, prosecutor, sheriff refuses to enforce controversial Washington gun control. Once again, we're talking an awful lot about sheriffs, but here we go. James Madison on state powers. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives and liberties and properties of the people and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. Okay, the states. Is he talking about the Department of Agriculture? 
You're talking about, about the ATF, right? He had to be talking about the ATF. No. He's talking about anything to do with daily life is done at the state level, which, what is a, what is a county? A subdivision of the state. Okay? So, well, I want to show you a two, we're going to show you a graphic example of what happened when this, uh, two very similar situations with tremendously different outcomes. This is very key, and this is the crux of, of the idea behind the Constitutional County Project. Okay, Waco, 1993, anybody remember that? Absolutely. Horrifying. I just came, I was fresh out of the Marine Corps, and I, I was horrified. Okay, what happened? I, and folks, when we talk about these two examples, they're very emotional issues. Try to remove yourself from the actual issue and look at it as just kind of a cause and effect, okay? We had some people in Waco, Texas, who uh, refused, refused to comply with federal government orders, okay? Now, in Nevada in 2014, you guys remember the Bundy Ranch, the, the Bundy Ranch thing here? Okay, all right, Hand, raise hands. I'm gonna make sure I raise, okay. All right, now, situation there, once again, you had some citizens who refused federal orders, right? They were different orders, but they were still federal orders to a group of citizens, right? So they're very it's a similar situation. Then, uh, you know, there were very, very different things that happened. And was there, uh, was there live news coverage uh, in Texas in 1993? I, how many watched it live? I watched it live. It was horrible. Okay. And in uh, Nevada last year, there was live internet coverage, right? A lot of people, I saw that live too. And uh, uh, here's the thing though. A, a lot of people have said that, that nothing bad happened in Nevada because the people were armed. But the thing is, were the guys in Texas at Waco armed? You better, be, you better believe they were. That's what the whole thing was about. So they had that in common as well. There was armed citizens on both situations. And uh, there were large numbers of armed federal agents uh, in, both, in Texas in 93 and in Nevada last year, right? And we all saw the pictures. We saw the guys with the machine guns and everything else. So that was a similar idea. Um, one thing that happened in Nevada that didn't happen in uh, Waco was that the uh, protesters were called terrorists. Remember that? Harry Reid saying that they were terrorists? We can't call ISIS terrorists. We can't call the guys cutting people's heads off terrorists. But we can call our own guys, right? Darn people on horses want to raise cows. And actually, the point I was making with the, uh, the reason that beef is out of control is because of federal action, regulation, and actually shutting down production of it. We're supposed to feed the world, and yet look at it. You know what I mean? Then why on earth are they stopping the guys that are feeding it? Anyway, okay. And there was a tense standoff in Waco, right? It was like 40 days or something, if I remember correctly. And there was a very tense, although shorter, standoff in Nevada, right? So on paper, these were very similar situations. What happened next? What happened in Waco? That's what happened in Waco. Okay. There were 86 people who died, including four ATF agents. And the uh, Branch of Indian campaign was burned to the ground. Okay. Horrible. Worst case, could not think of anything worse. What happened in Nevada last year? The uh, feds give in and release cattle. They gave him his cows back, right? They, uh, they gave him the cows back. There was no loss of life on either side and no prosecutions. There were some that died. But, uh, they, they, that, but, it, it, but they were released, the ones. In fact, here's a nice, see, here's the people looking there. Yay, free cows. Okay, here's the thing, though. The point being, though, exactly, is what was different. They were two, on paper, two very similar situations, but very, very different outcomes. And what was different? Right here, very famous photograph, um, what you don't see is this gentleman right here is an ATF agent here are the ATF SWAT teams. And here's a, this photograph shows, you know, there was the main one that just showed these guys. But there was a team here, a team here, a team here, a team here, and then there was other guys in reserve back there. Okay, there were dozens of armed agents there. There were also snipers on the hills over here and over here. Um, they were saying, in fact, uh, there's uh, people actually were first-hand witnesses in this room who they were saying, we will shoot you. 
I promise you that when law enforcement says that they're going to shoot you, believe them. That, that's, not a, that's not a threat. That's, you know. So here's the thing. What you don't see, and the most important thing is, is over here were two sheriff's deputies from the Clark County Sheriff's Department. Now, right here, they were saying, if you cross the fence, we are going to shoot you. Stop, we are going to shoot you. Fortunately, God bless the people, they, 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 they went up and then they stopped. But they were threatened, we are going to shoot you. Now, the reason this standoff was not a bloodbath and, and an example for future action is this. First off, did the Bureau of Land Management have the authority to go and take somebody's property? Without hearing, you know, they came in and they were, they were taking it. No, that's theft, right? And, well, we, there's a million different things, but suffice to say, though, that what we had here was a group of people who said, what you're, what you're doing is unlawful, we're not going to participate. The reason that the stand down was, was the two, one of them was the district commander for that district, uh, uh, the local district of the Clark County Sheriff's Department, and he, he and his assistant deputy walked out and literally stood in between the two parties. They were neutral in this, and so that changed the entire, uh, that and changed the entire situation. They ended up going back and forth and negotiating a peaceful resolution to this. Had, that is the only difference between Waco in 93 and Nevada in 2014. In, in, 2014, in, in, in 1993, there was no intervention by any other level of government. That was the national government coming in with help from the state. In this particular situation, the, the county government said, no, this isn't going to happen, and it didn't. Yes? There, there were armed citizens, however, down here, you will notice, if you look, there are no arms down here. Hang on, hang on. Yes, there were, but there were armed citizens at Waco. So that's, it was the same in both places. So you can't say that it was the armed citizens that stopped this, because in Waco, they had, they had armed citizens. In fact, they killed four ATF guys. So the idea being is that, yeah, that's why we tried to put what was similar. So you had your, uh, um, okay, sorry, this is going to go back a little ways. But this is a very important point. So armed citizens in Waco, absolutely. Armed citizens in Nevada, absolutely. The uh, thing being, the thing being, the difference was that. Because there have been other armed standoffs, and what happens in other armed standoffs? In core, the in Philadelphia in 1993, uh, they burned the. Uh, but anyway, I won't get into details. The idea being, though, is this: the difference in these two situations. What made the guys lower the SWAT teams lower their weapons was when the two deputy sheriffs walked out and inter and put themselves in between. It's one thing to shoot a citizen that you can call, you can make all kinds of labels and call all kinds of things. It's quite another thing for one law enforcement officer to shoot another. And that is, that was the difference in, in, in my humble opinion. Yes, sir. Correct. The cost, the, 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 Well, here's the, then whose fault is that? Whoever voted for those sheriffs. It's up to us to make these things issues in their elections or re-elections or what have you. It's us to put our foot down, right? Who's, who's in charge? Who, who invented government? Which came first, government or the people? The people, right? Therefore, we have authority over what we created, right? We have forgotten that. So 
You're right. You know what? And, and th th that is a problem. But you know what? Here's the solution. Here's the solution because we have found time and time again when the sheriff stands up for the people, they win. No bloodshed. You know? That's the thing. You know, we, the, uh, the whole idea of what we're doing, we're not anti-government at all. That's, a, you know, the, the, the usual thing you hear from the left. Oh, they're crazy anti-government people. Absolutely. As long as government's doing what it's supposed to within its constitutional limits, I'm a big fan. I've been to third world countries where guys were running around and there was no, uh, there was no law enforcement or any kind of social order. I don't want to go back. We need, we, need, we need government to do what it's supposed to do. We just don't need it to do you know, what it's doing today. So this is a way to make it, uh, this is a way of actually getting it done. Okay, copy, copy. So, all right, folks. Um, so, but does that kind of does that kind of make sense? That's a huge, huge, very, very important thing. This is why we chose. Part of the reason we chose this model was because there is actually historical precedence for it working. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we uh, we're gonna have to uh, kind of wrap things up here, folks. But let me uh, get into. All right. Okay, what happened here was we enforce, we, all, we, all, we know about horizontal separation of powers, judiciary, legislative, and all that. We also have vertical separation of powers, federal, state, regional, county, etc. And so what happened was this was what, what diffused and helped out there in Nevada was the enforcement of the vertical separation of powers. The county sheriff's deputies interposed between the citizens and the federal agents, and the county level of government nullified the unlawful attempt by the federal government to seize a citizen's private property, as they are supposed to. All right, um, how do you make a constitutional county? Well, you, uh, there are many ways, but you can encourage like-minded people to vote with their feet so that you can have like-minded people so that you can exert, you know, exert influence on the, uh, uh, the county government. Provide access to proven effective training to create local political teams of citizens, which then control their local institute government. And uh, we have uh, other people. Uh, actually, uh, Joni is here from the Center for Self-Governance. And uh, if you have any questions, they have the most effective uh, training that I've ever seen as far as get, regaining control of your instituted government. And uh, she'd be, is it okay if they talk to you afterwards? They'd be happy. Can you raise your hand? There you go. Um, and... Uh, Gain, gain control of county uh, and local level government specifically, but not limited to the county sheriff, attorney supervisors, and judges within a small number of election cycles, and create an easy to understand political strategy template, which can be duplicated in other counties nationwide. Because once again, here's the deal. If there are, once again, there's th like the 340 sheriffs, with, you know what, I'll, I'll say 340 is a heck of a lot better than one. It's, it's easy to, to, to attack one, it's hard to attack 300, right? Okay, um, all right, and there's other things at the state level. The, uh, this is a bill the 10th Amendment Center wrote that says feds would need permission from sheriffs uh, in bill passed by Arizona Senate committees. If this would only get put into law, it means that any federal agency has to check in with the county sheriff before they uh, do anything in that county. Can you imagine that? And you could say, well, EPA, you're, what you're doing is unlawful. You can't be in my county. Leave. Thanks for checking in, though. Can you imagine? What would that do... What would that do for our economy if we got a hold of the EPA? Where I live, we are in the biggest stand of ponderosa pine in the world. We had a tremendous logging industry. Do you know now we're a net importer of lumber in this country? Can you imagine that? We, it, there's no reason for it other than the federal government did it. Let the people who live there control the environment. Why? Who has a more vested interest in making sure that the environment's nice where I live? Me, right? I have to breathe the air. I, I have to drink the water. Do you think I'm going to let them pollute it? Heck no. But am I going to let them responsibly harvest those resources and have a good economy? Of course. So that's what we're trying to do. Okay. All right. Um, okay. We're going to skip through a couple of things. Okay. Bottom. How do we establish? Okay. Actually, you know what? Uh, following the ratification of the Constitution, a woman asked Benjamin Franklin uh, what type of government the American people were going to participate. What, what, she said, sir, what kind of government have you given us? A monarchy or a republic? What did, what did Benjamin Franklin say? A republic if you can keep it. 
right? All right. How do we reestablish constitutional government in the United States and keep the republic as envisioned by our founding fathers? That's a million dollar question, isn't it? One county at a time. 